today we're talking with Dr. Liz Anger, who is in Emeryville and an educational psychologist. You do assessments of children and adults, right? I do comprehensive neuropsych assessments to help um, young children all the way through adulthood understand their brains and how they work best either at school, at work, or just in life in general. ADHD is such a simple concept, it seems, and yet you can have 4 million types of ADHD, right? You're really breaking it apart into different symptoms. I, I had a lot of families who will tell me that just getting the diagnosis, but I think having a diagnosis versus understanding how your brain works are two different. A lot of the work that I do, I take a, a collaborative and therapeutic approach to assessment. The goal is to make sure that the child really understands themselves. We do that through the direct testing, making sure parents really understand what ADHD means and what it doesn't, and that they understand how this shows up for their child specifically, then for the child to understand what does this mean for me and set them up to continue that conversation over time, because it also changes over time. What it means for me at age eight is different than what it means for me at age 48. We want to make sure that those conversations are really vibrant in the house. When you tell a child that they have ADHD, what kind of language do you use? Yeah. I have created a construction metaphor that's really been working for me. If just sitting down with a kid and saying, guess what, you have ADHD can be really overwhelming and has unfortunately a lot of negative connotations. Even the acronym has some words in it that have negative feelings to them. We start the process very early in the evaluation and talking about what the child's strengths are, what they recognize as their strengths are, and then what's tricky right now. We talk about the strengths as highways. We do some psychoed around the brain and neurons and how they make connections. And some of those connections are very fast. We'll call those your highways, things that you've built over time, things that come naturally to you. We can usually make a big list of these, things I've learned from talking to teachers and parents and coaches. And then talk about what's tricky right now, what they're building on, what their construction projects are. Those are usually the reason why they're there for assessment. Kids might have different ways of describing things. Parents might say they have a real hard time paying attention. And the child might say, everything at school feels so boring. So we wanna work on the boring problem. Okay, let's work on that project and figure out how we can make things less boring. At the end of the assessment, we accumulate all this stuff. We can say from the testing, we learned that you have these additional highways, that your language is really strong. And I saw how curious and creative you are. I also noticed that, remember when you had to remember all those numbers, that was really hard and you kept rolling your eyes at me. Do you remember that? It turns out that you're not alone. Lots of people have highways and construction zones just like yours, and we call that ADHD. Then with kids, I'll describe what ADHD stands for, but then I'll say, you know what? It's not just about attention. It's not a deficit in attention because you, when you're doing Legos, man, you can focus like nobody's business. And hyperactivity, that sounds like a negative thing, but you have a ton of energy. You have hyper energy. That's part of what makes you so unique and awesome. They call it a disorder, but I would cross out that word and say, this is a different kind of brain. The reason things are tricky is because the way that your brain works is different than the way that the world expects you to work. So let's rewrite it. We come up with our own creative way to name their brain. Um, and it's really fun. It's a celebratory meeting. So many times when I present to kids that they have ADHD, they say, I knew it. I knew something was different. It's a beautiful moment, not, yeah a moment to fear or what's wrong with me moments. It's been really amazing. That's terrific. Your reports lead to accommodations in school. What are some of the most common accommodations that would result? It's funny because often the accommodations come from my conversations with kids. And by being super transparent during the evaluation, often they'll share with me what works. Or I'll be able to see the stool that they often sit on in my office. It's a little wiggly stool. I can see them moving around. <laughs> and I'll actually say, hey, I see that you're using that wiggle stool. Is that helpful for you? Do you like that? Let's put that on your tools page. Instead of accommodations, I'll call them tools to build your brain. We'll put wiggle stool there and then we'll talk about how getting 
getting up and moving is actually really helpful. So let's find ways. And they've had that experience in my office. We might say one of your construction projects is big projects that when you have like a book report, it's really hard to stay on top of it. And you know how stressful it gets. We're going to add a tool where we break things down into smaller pieces. Your teacher's actually going to check in with you more often, but they're not nagging you. They're doing something that works for your brain, which is breaking things into small chunks. It's a tool. Other things that can be really helpful for kids, teaching them some self-advocacy phrases, even just little things like, I need a break, or can you repeat that? And knowing that my brain sometimes is going to pick up on information that's going on outside. There's lots of stuff out this window right now behind me. And, and I might notice something because my brain takes in more information than most people. Now I just reframe that as something positive, but it also means that sometimes I might have to ask for the teacher to repeat or have a signal to call them over because I missed the instruction. I don't have to feel bad about that. I'm trying my best, but I have a way to say, oops, I missed it. I can self-advocate. I remember being a girl with ADHD and just trying so hard just to not stick out. It changes the narrative for kids because it's, oh, my brain was taking in something that was not the thing for right now. Teacher, can you help me get back on track? Is a way different narrative than, oh, let me just look around because I missed it again. Oh, can't pay attention. They're the two end, totally there's only different narratives. Times that a kid can do that in a class when there's 35 kids, right? So there's a, pro there's a little problem there. But what age do you think kids should be diagnosed ideally? A diagnosis makes sense when that mismatch between the way your brain is working and what is expected of you is causing some real challenges. That's when it's really important. We have so much variation in the way that our brains work and neurodiversity is a fact. There's a lot of the traits that we see in ADHD and autism and dyslexia, they're more common than we think. rises to the level of diagnosis and knowing about that and being able to work with how your brain works is really important. The more we have a vocabulary to talk about it, the more important it is. But a diagnosis um, is really important when that's causing a lot of difficulty. For a lot of girls, as you pointed out, sometimes it's internal. We don't always know about it until we start really paying attention ourselves to what's going on for them. When we ask them directly, what's your experience? It's this concept of lived experience. We need to know, even for a young child, even at six, they can describe what their lived experience is if we have the right tools and using something like this construction metaphor is a great way to get them to start talking about what's tricky then we start to understand how hard they're working for these kids who are working so hard whether we can see it on the surface or not a diagnosis can be a really important tool for helping them understand themselves in an empowering way You've written a whole book about this, right? I have. It was your book. Yeah, it's called <laughs> The Brain Building Book. And I've got one for older kids called Brain Building 101. Oh, nice. These are workbooks that practitioners can use during an assessment that help walk kids through learning about their brain. They really help build the case for the diagnosis. It's not a surprise. It makes sense to them. Then they have a book they can bring home and it's a book about their brain. A lot of practitioners around the world are using tools like this to really help kids understand. I'm actually in the process right now of writing a book for parents to be able to explain brains to kids. On my website, the explainingbrains.com website, there are a ton of free resources to help talk to your kid about ADHD. There's a script that walks you through how to talk to them about it with some fill in the blanks. You can fill in your kids' highways and what's under construction for them and videos you can show them so that they know that they're not alone. Some resources specific to girls. I think these conversations are so important to start as early as possible. What drew you to this problem? Obviously, this problem is foremost in your brain. It sounds like kids are getting demonized or stigmatized, right? Yeah, we're not trained as practitioners. I uh, have been doing this for almost 20 years now, and I was not trained, and my colleagues coming up right now are not being trained in how to talk to kids directly about their diagnosis. We get some training on how to present results to parents, 
but there's very little on how to talk to kids. What we do know is that there is research about ADHD and autistic adults in particular who are late diagnosed, saying that they went through their entire childhood thinking they were broken, that they were stupid, that they were lazy. It cost them. It's very costly. Now that they understand how their brains work, it is a relief. It is a rewriting of their narrative, but they've lost decades. I just really, in talking to these adults, wanted to find a way to start that conversation as early as we can. It turns out it's more tricky than we thought. The, the first family, when I went into private practice, that asked me to talk to their child, it seemed like such a no-brainer. The child had a huge emotional reaction because it catches kids off guard. They think there's something wrong with them. So this conversation has to be built over time. We have to show kids that their brains are under construction, that it's okay to have a different kind of brain and put it together piece by piece. Divergent brains they work best when they know what to expect. They work best when they have things in small bits. And we can do that to help kids really embrace and feel empowered by having a different brain by taking this approach. Trial and error is how I got here, but it's working and it's beautiful to see in practice. That's wonderful. You're so passionate about it. How did you get inspired to become an educational psychologist? Yeah, uh, I started as a teacher, um, which is the hardest job I have ever had, uh, including being a parent. So all the teachers out there, I think you do an amazing job. Um, but as a teacher, I loved circle time. And circle time was where we brought up problems and solved them together. I just thought if I could do circle time all the time, I would just love my profession. <laughs> so I went back to school, I became a school psychologist and uh, started to get really excited about helping kids understand themselves, understand each other. When I went into private practice, I fell into this space where I thought there's something we haven't solved yet, which is how to help kids understand their brains and their diagnosis. I have dedicated the last 10 years to trying to figure out and solve that problem. <laughs> Meanwhile, you have a, a son who's six years old. I have loved what you said about how you talk to him about his brain. Yeah, so we started really early talking to him. He's just a phenomenon to me and <laughs> watching his brain develop. He's a big feeling kid. He's sensitive. He takes in the world in all kinds of different ways. He learned in preschool this concept of flipping your lid when you get upset. It's from Dan Siegel, this idea that your emotions take over and your frontal lobe gets flipped when you're having a hard time. One day in the car, just out of nowhere, he says, Mama, you know what makes me flip my lid? When you rushed me. My husband and I just went silent. Papa, you rushed me and that makes me so mad. And Mama, you do it sometimes too. I need you to not rush me so that I can keep my lid attached. It was just such a beautiful moment of self-advocacy, of self-awareness for my child, and that we could learn something so important that has been true. This was two years ago now, and it's so true for him. We know now when we start to see what's happening, we can ask ourselves, are we rushing our kid? It's also often very true. I think this self-awareness is just critical. Yeah. But he's also more aware of other kids' brains, like the story that you tell about how he got compassionate. First, he said this kid was a bad kid. Oh, yeah. We read a lot of books about neurodiversity and different kinds of brains in my house. We talk about ADHD and autism. In this story, he came home one day, he just had started kindergarten, and he said, so-and-so is, is a bad kid. He's getting in trouble all the time. I said, I kind of wonder, maybe he's a different kind of brain. I wonder if maybe that he's having a hard time. A couple of days go by and he comes back and he says, I think so-and-so has ADHD. And I thought, oh no, like, why are you five and diagnosing your classmates? What have I done? But I asked why. And he said, you said that ADHD brains are funny and creative and really good friends. So-and-so is funny, creative, and he's a really good friend. But Sometimes he does things he doesn't mean to do. I think the teachers don't understand him. I just was so touched by how his lens had shifted on this kid from 
the bad kid to a misunderstood kid and how he was able to see all his beautiful, amazing characteristics. Just imagine a world where that's how we viewed different kids with that kind of compassion and understanding. Clearly your brain building book should be required in early grades. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's that would be great. Support. Thank you so much. Thanks Bye. so much, guys. Bye. Bye. We believe all girls with ADHD should get a fair start in life by getting diagnosed by age eight. Visit us at www.findtheadhdgirls.org. Thank you.